Well, good morning again. We've added a few to our number since we started, and we're always glad to see that. You know, we uh, are in our midweek fellowship. We are in the midst of studying the Gospel of John. It's a good name, right, John? Yeah. We're in the midst of studying the we're in the midst of studying the Gospel of John, and we are right about at that point now. We have we have uh, spent some time looking at the experience of Nicodemus, and uh, we will be going shortly to the fourth chapter, which is usually labeled the woman at the well. And I am convinced from the study of those two chapters that the greatest sermons that were ever preached were, was where one person was preaching and one person was listening. You know, you add to that, and I've said this a lot of times, Jesus assured us, he assured his disciples, and by way of his disciples, he assured us, he said, wherever two or three are gathered together in my name, and you know the rest of it, right? So I haven't really counted, but we have more than two or three. So I like to say that we have a heavenly quorum. So we can go ahead and start our business. Father in heaven, come speak to us, Lord. Not because we have a talented preacher, because we don't. Speak to us, Lord, not because we have a large pipe organ and a melodious choir, because we don't. But speak to us, Lord, because we have a need, which we do. And as Sherry so aptly reminded us in her Sabbath school remarks, we have a Savior who's never been late. In his name we pray. Amen. This is one of those Sabbaths, one of those uh, sermons where I start out going in one direction. And uh, even since I left my house this morning, my mind has been turning over and I don't, to be honest with you, by the time I get finished, I don't know where I'll be because it seems like, uh, you know, it's like a, a professor that I had in college that said, and I'm sure I've told you this before, but I'm an old man, so bear with me. He said, when you study the Bible, you scare out more rabbits than you can shoot. And... That's the way it is when you read God's Word and things keep coming in, and I'll probably forget half of what I started out with, and if I can make one or two points well, it will be a blessing and an encouragement to be here. I wanted to go to that, that uh, chapter that John read the uh, Scripture lesson from, uh, you know, that went along with our opening song, one thing I know, I was blind, but now I see. That is a fantastic text, isn't it, John? It just, it's like, uh, I, I, I love those places where Jesus uh, and, and, and some of those Bible characters put people in their place uh, so well. You know, I mean, he said, that the, the blind man said that so well. He, he summed it up so well. What else could you say after he said that? He said, I don't know whether he's a sinner or not. I, I, I don't know. One thing I know, I was blind, and now I see. That's kind of what I want to talk to you about this morning is about what is it that you see? And as I said, on the way to, to church this morning, another text occurred to me that I thought, I, I've got to get that one in. It's found in the 16th chapter of First. Samuel. Now, I have been criticized for many things. And usually I just try to let the criticism kind of roll off my back. 
after my wife has advised me that's what I need to do. <laughs> and, uh, but one of the things I've been criticized for is that I, I preach too much from the Old Testament. Uh, there are some people who kind of feel that the Old Testament is the old and we need to spend more time with the new, but, you know, and I think most of you would agree with me that the, the uh, New Testament enlightens us on those principles in the Old Testament, and so uh, we shouldn't do what another one of my professors used to say, we shouldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater. And so we need to hang on to the old and look for what the new, you know, you know, you know what I'm talking about. So I start this morning and hadn't planned on doing this, but start with a story from the Old Testament. It was at the end of the reign of the first king of Israel. Now, his name was Saul. I'm not going to let you go to sleep this morning. I'm going to keep asking you questions. All right? His name was Saul. And maybe sometime, if we have time, I will show you that he really wasn't the first king of Israel. But that's for another time. But usually, usually, historically, we've looked at him as the first king of Israel. And uh, he started out strong and went all the way downhill from there. Uh, and so God told Samuel, Samuel was God's spokesman, the prophet, the seer, and uh, he says, time to anoint a new king. Saul had been there longer than we usually think. You know, we, we, this, this, this didn't happen overnight. It was quite a long time. As a matter of fact, I, and I didn't look the verse up to prove this because I just thought of this on the way to, to, uh, to work. <laughs> I just thought about this on, on the way to church this morning. To, but, I, but I believe, and, and you can check me and correct me, uh, Saul had been king for 40 years. And as I said, it had all been downhill. He did some good things. But as the wise fool has said, uh, a stopped clock is right twice a day. And uh, he'd done some good things, but he was going in the wrong direction. And the Lord said to Samuel, his prophet, how long will you mourn for Saul? I've rejected him from being king over Israel. It was time for Saul to go. It was time for this new man that God had said would be a man after his own heart. It was time for him to step in. And God gave Samuel some instruction. He said, I want you to go to Bethlehem. I want you to go to the house of a man named Jesse. And look for the man that I will show you. That'll be the next king. So he goes there in uh, 1 Samuel 16. And in verse 6 and 7, it says, So it was when they came. They, they all come together. It said, It was when they came. And I'm reading from the uh, New King James Version, but it's pretty much the same there. It was when they came that he looked at... I pronounce that Eliab. I'm not sure how you do, but you know who I'm talking about. It was David's oldest brother. He looked at Eliab and said, that is, Samuel looks at him. See, Samuel is looking, and Samuel says, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. Now, why does he say that? Just looking at the first time he's ever seen Eliab or Eliab or however you want to pronounce it, and he said, this must be the one. Well, because he was good-looking, as verse 7 says, the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance 
or at his physical stature. See, they'd made that mistake before, if you'd call it a mistake. But they were attracted to Saul. Why? Because he was tall. He was handsome. Said he was head and shoulders above all the rest of the men surrounding him. He had difficulty hiding because his head stuck up above the rest of the crowd, you know. Well, I'm thankful that the Lord has a place for little short guys as well. And uh, it says here in verse 7, it says, The Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For the man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. That's, that's the focus of our time here this morning. Call it what you want. You know, I, I used to be very reluctant to, to speak about preaching a sermon. But I think I've preached enough of them in the last 40 years that I can admit that I'm preaching a sermon. So that's the focus of our sermon here this morning is... We don't see the same way that God does. As a matter of fact, I feel I've been convinced of this, that what we see is not what it is in many different ways. The last two years of my life and Donna's life have been very difficult. We have had times when our hearts were breaking, times when our bodies were aching. Still have a little bit of it. And still have the the heartache and the heartbreak. But it's not always what we think. And I'd suggest this morning that yours isn't either. And the Lord said, the Lord does not see as man sees. When we look at other people, we think we've got them pretty well pegged, don't we? We think we know what they're thinking. We think we know what their motives are. We think we've got them all figured out. And I think here the Lord is telling us, be careful, because what you see, what you think you see, is not necessarily what you get. Because why? Because like, even like Samuel of old, who was God's prophet, he was not seeing the way man, God sees. So, with that introduction, let's, let's go over there to the Gospel of John, the ninth chapter, to that precious story about the blind man. John 9, I'm going to read verses 1 through 7, and that's not all of the story, but you can fill in the rest of it later. Now, as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind along from birth. Okay. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents that he was born blind. Now, I'm resisting commenting on these verses. I just want to read them. here. Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said these things, he spat on the ground and made clay with the saliva 
and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay, and he said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. Now I'm sure that if you would consult an eye specialist, uh, I mean, what is the highest? It's not an optometrist, it's, but you know, the op, op, ophthalmologist. If you could, and, and you know, even some people who are better edu- educated and qualified than that, they really wouldn't be able to tell you how this, this happened because it was a miracle. The Bible doesn't try to tell us how the miracle happens. It just simply states he washed and came back seeing. That's all we need to know. Just, just like the blind man says later as he talks with the Pharisees, he says, I don't know. All I know is I was blind. Now I see. What else do you have to say? I, I would like us to do a little uh, comparison. You know, sometimes you learn by contrast, sometimes you learn by comparison. I would like us to do maybe a little bit of both this morning as we look first at the blind man and then as we look at somebody else. I'm going to ask you some questions. Look at the blind man. You have a picture in your mind. As you've read this, these verses before and the verses that follow, you're familiar with these stories. You've, you've read this story, I'm sure, many times in the book Desire of Ages, which is a wonderful commentary on this and many other stories in the life of Christ. Look at the blind man. What do you see? Let's first look at his physical condition. Of course, we know you would probably say the most important part of his physical condition is that he is he's blind. What else do you see about him? What do you what do you, what do you think his uh, his outward appearance was like? I mean, do you have a picture of this little gentleman with dark glasses with a well-trimmed goatee and snowy white. Is that the kind of picture you have? No. What do you think? Uh, tell, tell me if, if, if you um, have had the same impression. As I've thought about this story, one of the things that come to my mind first is that he was dirty. Do you, does that come to your mind? Maybe. Maybe not. And you know why I say maybe, maybe not? Because the text doesn't tell us. He may have been squeaky clean in his body and his clothes. But I think that he was dirty. And how about do you think he had on a, I don't know, what's, what's, uh, what is the, one of the most expensive brands in men's clothing? I don't know. Hartz, Schaffner, and Marks. That's the kind of suits that Cyril wears. Uh, do you think he had on a Hartz, Schaffner, and Marks? I don't even think he had on a J.C. Penney. I, I think he was ragged. Now, I, I don't know, see, because it, it doesn't tell us that. But we, when we read these stories, we, you know, if I were to ask you, and you'd say, well, yeah, I think he was ragged. And I would say, well, how do you know? One thing we know. He was blind. And he had been blind all of his life. Now, I've, this is something I've often wondered about, and this is a philosophical question, I guess. Think about it. If you had to be blind, which one would be worse? To be born blind 
or to be blinded 20 years later. You say, hey, preacher, <laughs> give me another option. I don't, <laughs> that, that's not a good option. You know, I don't want to be blind. You know, I, have a, I had a sister. She passed away several years ago now. But in her later life, she was afflicted by macular degeneration. It came very quickly, took its toll on her very quickly, and just in a short time, she was totally blind. I think she did tell me at one point that she said, I can kind of see light and I can see shapes, and you know, but basically she was totally blind and remained, of course, that way for the rest of her life because from what I understand, there's... Uh, this this uh, this malady can be arrested or it can be slowed down, but it can't be cured. I, I, that's what I understand. Now, maybe I'm wrong. But uh, so, which do you think would be worse, to be born blind or to get blind later? You know, to 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 be. What do you think? You think it'd be worse to get blind later? How about if you were sitting there on the in the marketplace? And, uh, you know, as the people were passing by and you heard people making comments, you heard them in conversation. And you, you heard somebody say, isn't it a pretty day? And you wondered, what's pretty mean? Or... The sky is so beautiful. Now, you might have some concept of what the sky is, but what is the difference between a beautiful sky and an ugly sky? Yeah, and, and, and someone say, the sky is so blue, and you'd say, I wish I knew what they were talking about. I say this is a matter of opinion. I mean, we all have our own opinions. I, th- I think that it would be worse to be born blind. Because I would have rather have had that experience and could remember what it was than to not have it. But we're not going to argue about that. He was born blind. He had been blind all of his life. And as he started out that morning to go on his, to go to work as a beggar. He must have thought, here we are, another day, just like all those days that have passed, no hope. No hope that he would ever see because he never had seen. Thought that just another day with no hope. Well, before we apply that, let's, let's go to, you know, we look at his physical condition, and, you know, we, we only know one thing about him. He was blind. What do you think his social standing was like? Had none. Now, this, I, I think this is one place. You know, I, I don't think that, that humanity is getting better all the time. I think humanity is getting worse all the time. But I think this is one place. There are some places where, where we are a lot better than we were back these 2,000 years ago. Because I, I don't think that, some, that most of us who would see a man with a white cane or you know, being led by a service animal, I, I don't think we would treat them the same way that the people in that day treated this guy. I think there, in, in one sense, and I, and I don't know what the reason is, I, 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 you know, I can't um, psychoanalyze people, but uh, I, I think in, 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 in this sense, I think we have more compassion. At least some of us do, and probably the teachings of Christ and the principles of Christianity have brought about that compassion. So I, I, I like to think that we would be more compassionate and understanding as we saw this blind man 
Although I don't know, boy, I open up a can of worms here. How compassionate do you feel when you see the guy out there in the street corner with a sign that says, anything will help? Do you feel compassion? Um, especially like the one I saw right out here in the street corner that says, why lie? I need a beer. But says he's sitting by the road. And I think, I think that's, that's an apt description of him. He's sitting by the road. He's sitting by the road as the world passes by giving little thought to him and to his plight and to his circumstances. I don't know, but in my mind, I don't think that he got invited to many parties. Or I doubt that, and, 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 and I, you know, I'm, I'm relating that to the way we are today. I, I, I doubt that there were, would be very many people who... As, as they left the synagogue on Sabbath, if they saw him there on the street, would have said, hey, why don't you come to my house for lunch? Got, got plenty. We'll, come on, take my hand. I'll lead you over to my house. We'll have lunch together. Probably not. Definitely not. Because he was tolerated as a tool to be able to demonstrate their generosity by throwing some coins into his bowl. But that was about the only use that they had for him. Am I surmising too much? Well, maybe. His physical condition was questionable. His appearance was questionable. His social standing was nil. And it wasn't his fault. He didn't become blind through some thing that he had done, or as Jesus said, even that his parents had done. And number three, he was a spiritual outcast. They said, who sinned, this man or his parents? What does that imply to you? Somebody had to sin. And you know, you, you, even, have a, you even have a text in the Old Testament, uh, which these guys were very familiar with. And it's, it's, it's found in the book of Job. And it says, the curse does not come causeless. He's blind. It's somebody's fault. Now, now tell us, Rabbi, if it's not his fault, who is it? If it's not his parents' fault, who is it? But we know it's got to be somebody's fault. The reason for his blindness is sin. Either he is a sinner or he is the son of sinners which is just as bad. And the implication was that he's such a bad sinner, he will be blind for the rest of his life. In other words, he was cursed. I remember a song Seth, if I'd known you were going to be here this morning, I'd have had you sing it. And I don't remember all the words. There's a, in the middle of it, I, I lose the line. But, One sat alone beside a highway begging. His eyes were blind, the light he could not see. He sat alone and wandered in the darkness. Then Jesus came and bade the darkness flee. When Jesus comes, the tempter's power is broken. 
When Jesus comes, and here's the line I forgot. <laughs> Jesus comes and bades the darkness flee. Did she tell me what it was? Okay. Jesus came and changed the whole picture. Now, we know now, I think I know now, why he was there. And he was there so God's mercy and God's power could be revealed. And these disciples said, Jesus could have said it, well, what do you see there? And the disciples would have said, we see a blind man who's obviously a sinner because he's dirty and because he's all these other things and he's blind, which is a result of sin. And Jesus said, just, just, just like he told Samuel back there, he said, you don't see the way God sees because you look on the outward circumstances and God looks on the heart. Let's go over to verse 13. We're not too far over time now. It says, They brought him who formerly was blind to the Pharisees. Now, by contrast, we looked at the blind man. By contrast now, let's look at the Pharisees. What about their physical appearance. And again, I read a lot of things into this story that I can't prove, but, but I, I, I remember, excuse me, I remember some references to them being arrayed in costly robes. No worn out clothes from the community service center for them. I wonder if they even wore a robe more than once. And I'm sure they were clean. Their beards were well trimmed. Their hair was combed. Their hands were washed. This is one of the things they were noted for, was their constant washing of hands because they feared ritual uncleanliness and because they sought cleanliness of body as well as cleanliness of heart. Don't you think they were well fed? Oh, they 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 fasted quite often. They fasted twice a week. What's, is that what the Pharisees said? Twice a week. But I think he was able to make up for it at other times. I don't think he went around hungry. They had a reputation for knowledge. If you had a naughty question about the scriptures, who would you ask? A beggar on the curbside of the street with dirty hair and blind eyes? Or a Pharisee? Their social standing was, they were in the, they, they had a reputation for knowledge and they were in the midst of everything. Now let's go back. I'm going to use Sherry as an example. Sherry's going to have a dinner uh, for the ladies, which I think is an excellent thing. Uh, the ladies aren't going to have to cook this one. And the men aren't going to have to do the dishes. Okay, But uh, that, that's a good thing, and I, I commend you for that, Sherry. But wouldn't it be a... What's the word? I'm not sure what that word means. It's a coup de grace. You know, wouldn't that be a capstone for your dinner if you could get one of these doctors of the law who really know about everything to come in and speak to your group? I mean, if, if, if you could have a if you could have a guest speaker like oh, but but some outstanding person which most people think are outstanding to come and speak to your group uh, as they were there eating their dinner, it would, be a, it would be a capstone. This would be the kind of the guy the Pharisee would be in his social context. One whose company was sought. To the human eye, 
they were set for life. And as we said, when we examined the blind man, we said he was cursed. So when we examined these, we could sum it up by saying they were blessed. But you know better, don't you? Yes, they knew God's word. Yes, they knew God's law. But they didn't know God. Someone has said they knew the 23rd Psalm. But they didn't know the shepherd. Because what you see is not always what you get. And even what you think you are, you can be fooled. You need to look at others the way God does. You need to see them through God's eyes. And let me add something else. You need to see yourself the way God sees you. Not even the way you think. Jeremiah says the heart is deceitful above all things. Who can know it? And the devil doesn't care. There's a ditch on both sides of the road and he doesn't care which one you fall into. You may spend your time thinking you are a lot better than you are or you may spend your time thinking you are the worst person that ever lived. And no matter which way you think, it's not as important as what God thinks you are. This is a, we just have a few people here this morning, but as I look out, I see some of you that have been with this church a long time. This church has been, uh, I see one charter member over here. This church has been here, what is it, 51 years now, right? 51 years. You've had a lot of good preachers that have thundered from this pulpit, that have divided carefully God's word. You've had times when these pews have been packed. You've had times when they've been nearly empty. I preached in this church a long time ago when there weren't as many people here then as there are now. Uh, this church has been a blessing to many. This church also has had its times when it's not been a blessing to many. Because we're human. That's not an excuse. It's an observation. But in any situation that God allows to exist, he allows it to exist because, remember the lesson of the story, the man was born blind so that the power of God could be revealed. Now, who would, who would even consider that the, that the, that the Lord could, could work a, a great thing in the largest church in our denomination? But, God can work in this church and in our lives just as well as he can in others. Because it's not the material that God has to work with that bring, brings the outcome. It's the power of God and the willingness of the material to be used. And if God can do a miracle in somebody else's life, he can do it in ours. And we can come forth from this service today seeing. That's not understanding. Because the blind man didn't understand. The Pharisees thought they did. But they didn't. I don't know. I don't know why... Things are the way they are. I don't know things in my own life. I, I wish I had answers for everything. I've got more questions 
then I've got answers. Someone has said a fool can ask more questions in a minute than a wise man can answer in a lifetime. I've got the questions, but I don't have the answers, except one. It is an opportunity for God to work in my life if I allow him to. And if I don't continue to look at how bad things are, but think about how good things can be when Jesus comes to bid the darkness flee. Just remember the truths that we hold and we teach that you understand in this church are truths about someone. And we remember that someone as the someone who can do for us whatever it is that needs to be done. Father in heaven, help us to remember this morning as an an uneducated lady once told me, I'm worth something because God didn't make no junk. Help us to see. Open mine eyes, Lord, that we may see Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen.